awareness about the vital role of wetlands for people and our planet. This day also marks the day date of the adoption of the Convention on Wetlands on 2nd uh, February 1971 in the Iranian city of Ramsar on the shores of Capsian Sea. The Ramsar Convention, an international treaty for the conservation of wetlands, was ratified by Government of India that the wet, uh, in 1982. And the wetlands are defined as the areas of marsh, fen, peatland or water, whether natural or artificial, permanent or temporary, with water that is static or flowing. It may be fresh, brackish or salt, and it includes areas of marine water, the depth of which at low tide does not exceed six meters. Did you know that the wetland is also referred to as the kidneys of the earth as they are responsible for regulating water and filtering waste from the surface? Also, wetlands covers only 6% of the earth's land and they are home to about 40% of the existing flora and fauna. In India, around 4.63% of the geographical area is covered by wetlands. In our efforts towards supporting sustainable solutions and ecotourism, CSR Niri has created a Smriti One in the campus, which houses varieties of medicinal plants used in Ayurveda. Niri is also developing a dedicated area in this one to wetland species of plants. This one is irrigated by the treated sewage from in-campus decentralized in-situ sewage treatment plant, which uses Neri's patented technology, Renew. CSR Neri is also appointed brand ambassador to Nagpur Machi Metro and is taking the initiative in spreading awareness on medicinal plants for immunity booster and will be distributing saplings to Nagpur citizens through kiosks in metro stations. Today, Niri celebrates World Wetland Day through an awareness seminar, which would comprise of a talk by Director, National Botanical Research Institute, and Director, and he is also the Director of Indian Institute for Toxicological Research, Lucknow, Dr. S. K. Bari. It will be followed by a question and answer session on the importance of wetlands and water with Dr. Rakesh Kumar, Director Niri, and Dr. S. K. Bari. The United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization has announced that this year's theme for the wetland World Wetland Day is Wetlands and Water. May I now request Director Niri to say a few words to the online platform members? Thank you, Dr. Nita, and uh, uh, welcome Dr. Bari, um, my colleague Anjan Ray that I can see, and many other colleagues who have joined. Uh, special thanks to Professor uh, Bari for agreeing to speak on this topic. Uh, uh, thanks are for two reasons. One is that this is a topic which is very, very close to him and he understands uh, better than probably no one else in this country. So, uh, Dr. Barik, thank you for uh, agreeing uh, to speak on this particular day while you are traveling, uh, which is which is more, more uh, you know, important and more uh, precious to us. The second thing uh, which is important is that on wetland, uh, our institute also has been working quite a bit and uh, this is also the time when we can commemorate and uh, talk about it and understand how this functions and also how to look at uh, science of ecology. So our institute has been doing, uh, uh, I would not say very significant work, but uh, a work which is significant enough uh, to make a small difference uh, in terms of solving real life problems. Uh, what is also important here, just two lines that I wanted to speak here, 
is that when we want to solve the problem of storm water drains contaminants and, uh, and and the other contamination which are there in sewage and other water our wetlands are the ones will actually do wonders and they 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 are the ones uh, which 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 were described by dr rita as well uh, that it has excellent excellent system which does a lot of things starting from sedimentation uh, in fact flocculation and also mixing all of these things happen in, in this area so uh, what we are looking at is the topic that dr barik has agreed to speak on on ecological flow or environmental flow uh, that is actually linked uh, very very strongly with the theme of uh, this year's this year's uh, world wetland day and i'm glad that we have been able to organize this on a very short notice so let's go ahead and uh, enjoy ourselves later okay. thank you sir uh, it is my duty to introduce the speaker to you uh, professor s k parik is the director of csir national botanical research institute and csir indian institute of toxicological research lucknow before joining csir he was the head and of department of botany and center for advanced studies in botany northeastern hill university shillong for the past 3 decades he has been active in diverse areas of plant science research such as plant diversity including its inventory bio prospection and conservation ecological modeling population and molecular ecology chemical ecology carbon sequestration and impact of climate change on species and ecosystems Professor Barik has successfully demonstrated the value addition of turmeric through production of turmeric leaf oil and oleoresin at community level in Meghalaya. He was selected the lead fellow by the leadership in Environment and Development International Rockefeller Foundation USA. He is the fellow of National Academy of Sciences India, fellow of National Academy of Agricultural Sciences. and fellow of international society for environmental botanists he was conferred many awards the latest being the biodiversity lecture award 2019 by the national academy of sciences india he is the chairperson members of several national and international committees and task forces constituted by the department of biotechnology science science and technology planning commission ministry of environment and forest and many other committees across the government of india he is elected as the national as the fellow of the national academy of agricultural sciences in 2020 may i now request dr professor s k bari to deliver a talk on a novel approach to determine e flow and cumulative impact assessment at river basin level dr bari please Uh, thank you, Dr. Rita uh, and Dr. Rakesh, Director Neeri. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. There is some technical hiccups here because that loading is taking some time, and the person is coming because I am outside my own place. So little bit arrangement might be there coming just to connect my presentation. Before that, I will just talk something so that uh, we can make up the time. Uh, well thank you dr rakesh this uh, international wetland day it is so important and uh, for giving me this privilege to talk to um, uh, everybody on this auspicious occasion me that uh, i thought what should i talk i thought that uh, a few uh, around 3 4 years back uh, we conducted a study rather 4 years back i conducted a study when the country was trying to introduce the cumulative impact assessment Uh, that uh, what should be the really impact it is not that single uh, project uh, impact but we should have that completely at a landscape level if say for example there are 10 cement factories naturally we do the eia as per the indian environmental act or the eia guidelines only one cement plant we do so actually it doesn't serve the purpose because individual each cement plant will not have that much of impact when we calculate the total cumulative impact of 10 uh, 
फैक्ट्री इज कमिंग इन द सेम वे सेम वे इतना रिवर्बेशन वी वर डूइंग द इंडिविजुअल पावर प्लांट बेस्ड और रिवर्बेशन प्रोजेक्ट बेस्ड इवेल्युएशन इंपैक्ट असेसमेंट बट व्हेन इट कम्स टू द एंटायर बेसिन वी डोंट हैव एनी नॉलेज बेसिकली वी डिडंट हैव एनी मेथड एंड प्रोटोकॉल एस्टैब्लिश्ड फॉर दिस हाउ टू रियली एस्टीमेट द टोटल और क्यूमुलेटिव इंपैक्ट असेसमेंट दैट इज नंबर 1 number thing is suddenly we came that yes our rivers are dying because of these power projects and we should completely ban these hydro projects so that really uh, made a very uh, you know impact on the whether it is the industries or in, on the environment so that was a point when uh, minister of arun forest uh, on the their request and also government of arunachal pradesh requested me to take up a study in the towang uh, which is very high altitude above 4500 meter elevation so there were 13 projects were coming together and uh, what will be the cumulative impact and what should be the e flow environmental flow one should allow so that the rivers are not killed rivers are alive at the same time can we optimize the power projects also so that was the impact not that completely kill the uh, rivers nor the completely stop the power projects so how do we make a balance that means that's what we know always environmental impact assessments are done because to make a balance between the development and environment so precisely this was the objective where i took the challenge and i think for the first time we established a methodology and a protocol how to estimate the e flow uh, although people were doing earlier several methods building block method these that but we thought that the ecosystem approach life uh, uh, means you know the water approach hydrology approach as many as approach we can integrate to that uh, method so that in a more practical and a feasible e flow estimate can be done so this is the story of this work which i am going to present you so it was one of the uh, highest uh, as i said bordering china just uh, in that area we will cross one boundaries there then china that side china's force and this side india's force and uh, at the above 4800 5000 meter elevation so at that level the river towang starts originates and along that 13 cascading projects were um, power plants were pr proposed so we started working on that and it was a very herculean task as you can imagine the geographic condition and uh, also the forests are untouched and many of them were not uh, inventorized before so that is the story behind this so i will now start that presentation how the 13 projects Uh, in that river base that towang river basin how do, do we calculate that yes it should be this project should be rejected this if uh, 10 projects 8 projects 9 projects come what will be the impact so that is the story i am going to tell you and a methodology we established uh, so give me just a few minutes i will just upload now the slide uh, yeah please yes yeah take your time no problem
Dr. Barik, if you are facing a, a problem, you can actually mail it to us as well and we could have uploaded from here. If that works out. Dr. Bari, can you hear us? Sir, I think he has left. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he has to rejoin. Yeah, he will have to rejoin. This oh, message. Ah, oh, he has joined. Mm -hmm. Sir, we can see your slide. Okay, thank you. Okay, so now you can see? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, so uh, this part's like this? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so sorry for this inconvenience, you have to wait. So as I said that uh, this is a novel approach which we uh, employ to determine the e-flow and cumulative impact assessment at river basin level. <coughs> you can see that uh, this is all related works. When we develop any basin, it is the sustainable development of basin is the objective. We do the impact assessment of individual projects, cumulative impact assessment, e-flow, carrying capacity assessment, 20 years perspective development plan because uh, it takes at least to make 20 years functional and landscape level biodiversity management plan. So all these are integrated whenever you do any basin development or landscape level work, we usually do this. So out of this, I'm just talking today about the two which are the red lighted, highlighted, cumulative impact assessment where we took the multi-level approach, basin level, project level, and socioeconomic level. Where we use the techniques and methods like network analysis, matrices, GIS, mathematical impact models, mathematical indexing, checklisting, and expert consultation. When we talk about the e-flow, that is the holistic approach we take, building block method we take, ecosystem structure, function and services, hydrology and hydraulics, biodiversity, livelihood and cultural as aspects. So you can see when we do the building blocks, this is very poorly defined by many people, but we are taking ecosystem structure and function, number one, uh, of course, services, hydrology and hydraulics, number two, biodiversity, three, livelihood and cultural. So all the aspects we have taken into consideration. So I'll go to the next. So these are the site because it is a case study. So you can see the proposed location of the, all the hydroelectric projects in Tawang River Basin, TRB is Tawang River Basin. So you can see the location of the 13. So these are the rivers. So actually you can see if the cursor you can see here, the, this is the Nyamjangshu River Basin, this comes here and this is the Tawang. So this is the China border, this boundary is the China here. So the uh, uh, Sachu River, Sachu one project, it comes. Uh, just please excuse me one second, yeah. Um, Madam Bully, Bully, yeah. Hello, hello. Okay. Uh, then you can see that uh, biological environment, so where we do the ecosystems, habitat fragmentation and instruction due to construction activity, destruction, deforestation and loss of plant species, impact of flora due to increased flow of water, IS invasion, that is invasive species, impact of, on threatened plants, endemic animals, impact on animal species due to deforestation, land clearing, impact on animal distribution, migration routes, impact on fauna due to decreased flow of water, impact on breeding and nesting grounds, Periphyton and zooplankton density. So human environment, existing environment infrastructure, socioeconomic profile, culture, religious profile, resource use, traditional knowledge system. So all these things we take care. Sorry, there is. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, so you can see that again, that is further divided into different activities. Many of you know these. 
whether it is the air, changes in ambient level, noise, geology, geomorphology, seismicity, soil, water, climate, land use and land cover, uh, ecosystem diversity, plants and animals, existing development infrastructure, socioeconomic profile, all these data we collect as you know. So these are the uh, hydropower project sites where we did the survey for the plants. So you can see in the inaccessible areas, still we could cover substantial areas. And here is the uh, camera traps we, we put it because as you know, 10 kilometer radius is the uh, core zone where we take up the works and all these areas were overlapping. So you can see those are the areas where pink colors are there, camera traps were put for the animal survey. And you can see here the animal survey by foot only, we surveyed the uh, whether bird or any other animal, the total species we do, did it. Here is the air sampling station as usual. Here is the, you can see the villages, uh, quite a substantial number of, you can see out of 9,477 households, we have covered 1,917, so 20.3, 22.3% households were covered for socioeconomic data. So as you know, the slope survey, uh, climatic zones, all these things we uh, developed completely de novo, then we prepared the dam. Uh, elevation model, then the soil, then the elevations is finally you can see that those are the land use land classification, land use land cover classification. So this is the st structure of the wetlands you will find other than the river. So these are the lakes in the high altitude. You can see that all the around that uh, it is a more than 5,000 5, meter elevation. So you can see these are the high altitude lakes. So the another lake is here. So uh, popularly this is known as Madhuri Lake because that movie Koila was actually the shooting took place here. So that's why, so these are the high altitude lake structures they are. So you will find that the live forms and this is the, in the river, the, it is a very important algae which is edible. There is the Prasciola crispa and this is, uh, you know, per bunch they sell 20 rupees only, but it is highly nutritious. Later on we wanted to add value to this. So this is the wetland value. You can see this is the black neck crane. People believe that the, because these Buddhist people are there, they feel that this is the incarnation of their Lama. So actually this is a very in the Pangchen Valley of the uh, Nyamjang Chu project. So you can see this black net gray habitat. So while from coming from Siberia to uh, going towards the lay, they take rest here. So this is very important habitat. So these are the, some of the animals which we captured through the, uh, you know, camera trap, Himalayan sero, black bear. You can see the sero, golden cat, wild pig. Barking deer, Himalayan gorel. So these are all captured through the uh, our uh, camera traps. And these are the you can see that uh, all, all of these are the uh, algal component and a huge amount. But I am just showing the glimpse only. Uh, some of these diatoms. These are the fish. Sajothorax richardsoni, very famous mahasir. It is very important fish. So this one and the Sajothorax progastus, so these are the two endemic but very uh, the critically endangered species. So they are also found and this interesting part is the Sajothorax. Uh, they uh, stay in the little bit lower elevation but for the egg length they will uh, climb all the across up to that 3500 meter elevation. So these are the life forms. So you can see capped langur and also the Oronachal macaque endemic, this red one. So these are the, some of the, these are the beautiful birds of this area, butterfly. Of course, the mushrooms, these are the Panax bipinatifidas, very, very important and threatened categories of species. And the Munpa tribe is the inhabitant, so we'll find the traditional crafts. So all these things are some of the glimpses how we document. And this is interesting part you can see here from actually the river Tawang originates. And this one is in China. And there are 108 holes. People believe that these are all religious ethos which are, accept, which, which are attached to the people. So this uh, Tawang River starts from here, from the 108 holes. And people believe that that is the, you know, very, very sacred, that's why, because of the God. So this is the origin of the river. So we classified also the whatever existing classification is there. Plus also we got several new forest types, vegetation types we classified as the, you can see up to 5,500 meter elevation. Alpine forest, we did the survey right from starting from 1000 meter elevation. So this is the Tawang and you can see that each and what we did before we start the cumulative, we did the individual 13 projects impact assessment. So for each project, as you know, the issues are different, challenges are different, mitigation measures are different. So you can see here, say for example, this one, 
uh, impact on river ecosystem and associated faunal diversity. So all these things are identified. Then what is the mitigation, adapting strict management and regulatory options for pollution? E flow needs to be adjusted to minimize the impact on river ecosystem and the funnel species. Minimum acceptable free float length between the two successive projects is to be maintained. So these things are some of the mitigations were suggested and which we included in the, I am not going in detail, but these are the approach we, we took it. So these are the possible impacts on threatened floral and funnel components at the basin level. Possible impacts due to seismicity, hydrology, and water quality. So detailed analysis we took off. So you can see then again the individual project wise. So Niam uh, Jangshu, this is the which I was showing you the black net plains habitat. So cumulative impact we start now. So these are the individuals you always do. So there is nothing novel in it. Most of the things you do, but now coming to the uh, cumulative impacts, the so first line I will just see, the analysis of cumulative impacts at river basin level is important because significant environmental changes occur owing to accumulation of seemingly minor impacts over time and space in addition to result of direct major impacts. The cumulative impact could be linear, additive or synergistic depending upon the nature of the proposed project activities, future and past actions. So this is very important. You have to take all the future proposed activities as well as the past actions along with the project present activities and their interactions. External environmental drivers and risk factors have additional aggravating impacts on the river basin. So in this, the most key word is the potential impacts. Whatever you do, a holistic analysis approach is required to characterize the potential impacts on ecosystems and valued ecosystem and social components, VECs, we say that. So this valued ecosystems and valued ecosystem and social components, that one you have to see that what are these VECs, first you define it. So subject specific expertise, past experience and examples from case studies available literature and tools on the subject, extensive consultation with the stakeholders, and intensive field works were used to prepare this report and arrive at an acceptable conclusion. So this is the VEC identification. So a cumulative, uh, the highlight is a cumulative impact assessment index for each project was developed using 31 identified aspects under six selected VECs, which you will see the letter on what is the VEC, and the index was used to assess the relative contribution of the individual project to the cumulative impact of the basin level. Well, uh, sorry, it is not moving. Yeah. Uh, you can unshare so, and share again, maybe. It's no, it is okay. It has come now. It has come now. It is the slide of the analysis of community impact, that slide. No, it has come now, the next one, components of cumulative impacts. No. Yes, it has come now. Achha, now okay. it is. Yes. Uh, I think there are connectivity is poor here. That's why it is all this happening. Uh, in, in, so when we see that components of cumulative impacts, what are those? First one is the indirect impacts. Impacts on the environment, which are not a direct result of the project often produced away from or as a result of a complex pathway, sometimes referred to as second or third level impacts or secondary impacts. For example, a development activity that changes the water table and thus affects a nearby wetland. So this is the indirect impact. The project has nothing to do, but other things are there so that they are impacting. Impact interactions, the reactions between the impacts that include between the impacts of just one project, between the impacts of other projects in the area, that is two major developments being constructed adjacent to one another and during the overlapping time periods will have many interactive impacts from land use issues to construction and operational noise. So what is cumulative impacts? Impacts that result from incremental changes caused by other past, present and reasonably foreseeable future together with the project. For example, incremental noise from a number of separate developments, combined effect of individual impacts, noise, dust and visual, from one development on a particular receptor, several developments with significant impacts individually, but which together have a cumulative effect. So you can see the pictorially, you can see it is one project, project one, project two are here. So they, sorry, so they have the impacts and both the impacts, they interact each other. And finally, the cumulative impact is there. And the VEC is that, that is our target, which we are telling, we'll define it. Same way you see a planned activity one, one project, but they have several impacts, impact one, two, three, four, and all that they result in the cumulative impact plus indirect impacts are also there. So this is the concept. So when we took the type of cumulative impact and main characteristics with examples, 
you can see the time crowding type time lag space crowding cross boundary cross border fragmentation compounding effects indirect effects triggers and thresholds say for example time crowding how do you define it effects on an environmental system if it is one time impact fine but if time crowding again and again it comes keeps on coming so repeated say example repeated coliform introduction through waste disposal and sewage going to increase population pressure and activity so this is the time crowding because continuously the colonies will release or the whatever the factories they release time lags delayed effects sediment trapping at successive barrages leading to impairment of river system in long run so this is the time lag space crowding high spatial density of effects on environmental system pollution and sewage discharge into the influence zone of individual project so one say for example 10 km if you define 10 km radius so it is beyond the 10 km radius loss in ecosystem services in basin area that is water table lowering and reduced capacity of carbon sequestration there is an example cross border international boundary the project which you are doing so china will do something and it will impact our uh, area landscape so dam break and fast floods in tawang river basin would impact the downstream region in bhutan like ours because after this tawang area it goes to bhutan then from bhutan again it comes to the assam so you see that china will create some nonsense things it we will be impacted in india and we will do something bad like uh, damage of the bridge and uh, dam then the bhutan will be affected and again in bhutan the dams they will do something assam will be affected again in india so this is the cross border and a fragmentation change in landscape and watershed pattern forest fragmentation due to deforestation and river fragmentation due to the barrage construction or dam construction so the whole ecosystem is getting fragmented compounding effects effects arising from multiple sources or pathways say for example decrease in river primary productivity due to synergy in altered biogeochemical cycle and species composition in river ecosystems so this is the compounding effect uh, indirect effects that is the secondary effect social infrastructure development so naturally you will develop so many social infrastructure that will impact that is the indirect impact to the river system triggers to deforestation so these are the analysis which we do how the cumulative impact and main characteristics we analyze it well same way the cumulative impact assessment framework so naturally first you should have a framework which you are going to follow so first is the scoping then collection of baseline and assessment of impacts identification and development of mitigation measures evaluation of significance and monitoring and evaluation under that the tasks are under scoping identify regional issues of concern select appropriate regional valued ecosystem and social components identify spatial and temporal boundaries identify other actions that may affect the same species identify potential impacts due to actions and possible effects consideration of alternatives so always alternatives is the best but it is not available most of the time collection of baseline and assessment of impacts naturally all this you know complete the collection of regional baseline data assess effects of proposed action of selected unselected vcs assess effects of all selected actions and selected vcs identification and development of mitigation measures recommend mitigation measures impact shifts evaluate the significance of residual effects compare the results go against thresholds or land use objectives and trends monitoring and cumulative impact using identify indicators so the uh, steps in cumulative impact assessment first is the scoping phase 1 identification of vcs identification of the special boundaries of the cia cumulative impact assessment here in our case it is the river basin of tawang identification of temporal extent of the cia in our case it is 20 years we have targeted scoping phase 2 identification of other existing and predictable nano i will call you back uh generation of best yeah establishment of baseline status of vcs because we are now interfering in the ecosystem so first we will baseline data whatever is collected we have to establish it establishment estimation of trends in vc condition establishment and estimation of thresholds for vc condition so these are the difficult tasks actually how do you establish the trends and how do you establish the threshold because data are not available in most cases assessment of cumulative impacts on vcs establishment of indicators for expression of vc condition estimation of future baseline or condition of the vcs estimation of the project impact on vc condition and estimation of the cumulative impact on the vcs so similarly step 5 is the assessment of significance of anticipated cumulative impact 
significance of the foreseen impact on the VECs, management of cumulative impacts, design and implementation, identification of additional project mitigations for individual projects, beyond the identified in respect of EI reports, individual EI reports, identification of additional mitigation measures for other existing or future projects, other strategies and activities that could maintain VECs at acceptable conditions, contributing to a multi-stakeholder collaborative approach for the implementation of management action that are beyond the capacity of a single project proponent. Then stakeholder engagement is the most important. Engagement of all stakeholders. Sir, your slide is not moved. Parik, sir, your slide okay. is not moved here. Now is it moving? Yes, sir. That's okay now. Okay, so now it is tools used in CI of Toang River Basin. Is this slide there on the screen? Tools used in CIA. No, sir. The next one. I think it is should be the next one. I have stakeholder engagement. Step. Okay. Step. Now it is the next. I think it will come now. It has come. No, not yet. Yeah, it has come. It has come. Table two point two. Tools used in CIA of Tawang yeah. River Basin. Yeah. Come. So you can see that now for each of these tasks which we defined framework tasks, we have the methods and events and tools used. For example, scoping. Identification of VECs, as I said, determination of spatial temporal boundaries. So how do you do expert opinion, matrices, network and systems analysis, consultations, questionnaires, checklist, spatial analysis. Same way, collection of baseline and assessment of impacts, as you know, baseline current status of VECs, identification of all developmental activities affecting VECs, assessing cumulative impacts of VECs future, Checklists, consultations, mapping, overlay, GIS, network and system analysis, expert opinion, modeling. Same way, identification of mitigation, mitigation measures and mechanism, monitoring, expert opinion. So like that, we have to define for each framework, we have to go ahead. So that same way, we will see the tools and the VCs and attributes and indicators. For impact models, detailed assessment of cause-effect relationship between reduced flow due to project implementation and valued resources. Special analysis using GIS and geospatial modeling. Through that, we can quantify land use changes, invasiveness due to implementation of the project, landscape level indicators of providing numerical values that represent large scale disturbances. And water quality to determine the minimum threshold. Well, now the forecasting the CIA. So how did we do actually now? So those are the basics and the background so I will say you here now, a wide variety of methods are used for CI analysis. Methods are chosen based on the information available for the analysis. In the present study, quantitative estimates of cumulative impact were undertaken through developing a social development index. All the social parameters were combined for each affected impacted village and cumulative impact assessment index to assess the relative contribution to each proposed project to the cumulative impact on the river basin. So what I will just tell you briefly, Say so there are so many villages are there, say 56 villages are there, we conducted, but data is so vast, unless you compress that, you cannot do. So we developed the social development index, which you will see several parameters have been taken. Same way, the environmental impact also we calculated, those VECs all we took it, and after that what happened, we determined a figure, a threshold we reached. Say for example, one, above one, if a particular project reaches, out of those 13 projects we evaluated, if a particular project has a cumulative impact assessment index, CIA value is more than one, the project is cut. No, it is not sustainable for the uh, our basin. And below the one, they are allowed. So that is the way we developed. Well, so now going to the next. So this is the socio-economic development index where Potisys village data were involved. So you can see here, land use at the village level, use of private land, number of households, again, sub criteria are there. You can see here, all other indicators are responding. So that values were there all. So you can see here, 10 values are, 10 subheads are there, like occupation profile of the people in the village, information on population size, number of workers, number of main workers, marginal workers, non-workers, so all these data were collected, whether it is from the several secondary sources, primary sources, so composite index on this, uh, 22 uh, parameters were calculated then, compressed. And you can see the method which we use formula for 46 villages. So number of villages 46 and accordingly we got it. So the final value PC1 through PC8, we got it. The tabular tabular values are there. So through the eight PCs for 56 villages, we considered 56 points or vectors in eight dimension space. And finally, you can see that the 
for illustration, Nam Sering has the highest length one and Kalantang has the zero length. For the sake of interpretation, Nam Sering obtains the largest score and Kalantang is the at the bottom. So that means they are the bottom means they are the lowest developed socioeconomic index wise. And highest was the, the Nam Sering village. So that is you can interpret easily. So that way CIA index also we did. So how do we do? As I said, ecosystem structure, function, and services. Again, you can see there are several parameters under that. Whether it is the carbon stock loss, ambient air quality, periphyton, zooplankton density, net primary productivity, change in turbidity, total coliforms count, invasive species invisibility, dependency of villagers on hill streams, spring water. So total nine effects are there under one. Similarly, you can see that six parameters are there. One is ecosystem structure, function, services, biodiversity, ecosystem vulnerability, hydrology, culture and livelihood and dependency on natural resources. Here, culture and livelihood is very important because you know interesting things it came to our light. In the Mompa and the, the, among them, they have a very peculiar habit that after the death, they will cut the body, dead body into 108 pieces and they will throw into the river. And the river water must have that much of water to absorb these dead bodies also. So that is an interesting part which nobody will think of also. So we have to maintain that much of water level in the river so that they can put the dead body inside the river. So like that, important parameters were defined and all these, you can see that they are the CIA parameters. So then this is the method how we compress the data and finally we developed one index. So this is the index. You can see the each column is, uh, is a project, Thingbuchu, New Meling, Manguchu, and Nikrangchu, Ro, Sachu 1, Sachu 2, Sachu Lawyer, uh, Towang 1, Towang 2, Ninjangchu, and Jaswantgarh, and the <coughs> Paikangchu. So these are the 13 projects, and each one of now, after working out all these values, you can see we have one value. So those which are beyond one, they have higher impact on the basin, so they should not be allowed. Here, can, two projects you can see one is the Sachu 1, which was in the border of the China and this is the, uh, the thing Bochu. So uh, e-flow now, now that is the cumulative impact assessment. So you can see that we developed a method uh, which can really uh, define the threshold for sustainability of the whole basin uh, and how to reject them or how to accept them. So now the river flow, you can see here, uh, there is no set specific norms for the e-flow to be released. This is due to the fact that environmental conditions vary widely among the rivers, even it is heterogeneous at different points along the course of the same river. Besides the heterogeneity in river ecology, the issues concerning livelihood dependence on river, river biodiversity, river hydraulics, river bank ecosystem properties, sensitive issues relating to sociocultural rights and practices vary, vary extensively among the ecosystems and human societies. Therefore, a universal norm for e-flow cannot be set. So in India, Expert Appraisal Committee for River Valley and Hydroelectric Power Project of Ministry of Animal Forest recommends 20% of average lean flow of 90% dependable year for lean season, 30% for the monsoon and 20 to 30% average for the monsoon is that just it is a thumb rule type, but there is no scientific basis behind this. So we wanted to develop a scientific basis on that. So you can see the data were calculated and the projects for the 10 day discharge series have been generated by area proportionate approach. So then we started the developing the building block method. So building block method is not a new word, but the parameters which are including there, that is important. Because if they suppose only the hydrology you add or the only the stakeholders consultation process you add, many important parameters are left out. So we included several, almost all important parameters which are required to take care of the people's interest and the reverse interest and the biodiversity of the river, everything were taken into consideration. So you can see identifying the critical components known as the building blocks of the flow regime that govern environmental conditions. So you can see we have taken these five parameters, ecosystem structure, function and services, river biodiversity, river hydraulics, cultural requirements and livelihood requirements. So these things parameters we took, which I have shown you. So uh, analysis of hydrological parameters is a prerequisite for e-flow determination. The hydrological analysis of TRB included the following, 90% dependable flow analysis, lateral flow contribution analysis, because not only in the dam site or in the powerhouse site, it is not only in between that, wherever lateral flow are there, also we took it into consideration. Analysis of river plus succession and hydrodynamic modeling using, you know, that HECRAS model. Well, so these are the further different uh, projects, HECRAS model projections. So this is the result. 
90 percent dependable year season average flows and simulated conditions for all projects within the river network you can see each project where is the dam side and the down one also in the lean season monsoon season and the non monsoon season so you can see and we can see that for parameter minimum threshold we decided lean season value for different environmental indicators and corresponding discharge on trb determined so many of these we did the model predicting that through the model say for example i will tell you here say for example salinity minimum threshold lean season value for the river basin so suppose in the lean season in the winter months the salinity was 0.1 so that means the river ecosystem can tolerate that so what is the required flow there so you can see minimum threshold lean season discharge at any point of the basin so 5 qmax so that we have to maintain it so 5 qmax is required for maintaining the minimum salinity level in the uh, river same way all these parameters say for example periphyton density 110 in the lean season so for that 4 qmax of water is required so we decided that this is the minimum flow required you can like, allow more actually but minimum flow this one so that river life can be sustained that is equal to the lean season flow and all this basis on individual parameters we did say for example this one needs total alkalinity needs to 2 qmax it is not important for us because already we are maintaining 10 qmax in the black net crane case so if we are able to maintain the 10 qmax water then black net crane habitat will not be disturbed so automatically if you are maintaining this 10 automatically all other parameters which are less than that taken care of so that is the objective you see the death ritual which you are telling the story death rituals means you can see the 9 qmax water is required for the dead body disposal so even if you for black net crane you manage it in that uh, uh, particularly nyamjang chu project so automatically your death rituals will be taken care of and all other water parameters quality parameters also maintained so that edible algae also it will be done because for them 5 qmax is required so 10 qmax is the lean season discharge that was the decided so i believe now it is clear that how taking on the different parameters most of them many of them could be ecosystem level many of them could be water quality many of them could be biodiversity you can see now water depth for cyanothera species that uh, i was telling that uh, mahasir for uh, that need at least 5 qmax of water because the minimum threshold lean season value is the 0.5 the density so uh, that way we divide the depth so accordingly we decided for each uh, project to one two hcp so raw hcp so what is the lean season average again we did 90% dependable year if 10% water average we leave 70% we do how much of water will flow so discharge quantity we calculated based upon the uh, 90% dependable years release of the average accordingly we calculated what is the water required so this is the particle size distribution of the bed material so you can see that velocity river flow velocity hydraulics characteristics depth and flow height all these things were monitored and monitored and this is the cross section of the river for each river you can see the river is back side in the figure photograph and this is the cross section we did so all the sites we did for all the projects uh, then after that you can see that we did the hecras model hydrodynamic modeling we did it finally the you can see the longitudinal profile all these things we completed then i was giving you the values which were seen and they were not random you can see the modeling we did it and the baseline line that determines the lowest lean season value accordingly we decided what type of salinity that was i telling you that 0.2 is required or 0.1 is required accordingly we decided through this modeling so multi stage three modeling sml modeling whatever depending upon the parameter these are for different parameters in the water so we did that then uh, okay periphyton density you can see so this is the red line in the base is the best line which we decided finally so this is the lean season 39 qmax model output you can see for the release of dependent in the towang 2 hcp so monsoon 141 qmax you have to leave 67 qmax in the non monsoon so that way we decided that if is what will be the water availability so accordingly you can see the final one we decided corresponding predicted water discharge acceptable limit for various indicators on different vcs and required discharge during the lean season so this is the last one is the best these are the parameters highest value lowest value then acceptable value and that based upon the modeling which i just show you and finally this is the qmax of water we have to discharge so accordingly you can see that hydraulic condition requirement uh, e flows requirement for all the studies of hcp so finally we decided that what will be the for non monsoon monsoon and lean for each project it is different different you can see it because the project size is different barrage height dam height is different 
So accordingly, for each specific, we prescribe that this much of water should be flow, so river will not die, river life will not die. So like the novel aspects, what we did, primary data were used in all aspects, including the CWC raw data. Uh, we got from CWC for the past 20 years, but it was all the raw data, so we modeled them. Six building blocks were identified relevant to the basin, which hardly people do it, one or two parameters they do. E-flow was determined based on threshold flow, giving equal importance to all the indicators, building blocks. Threshold flow for each indicator was determined based on extensive knowledgeable public expert consultation or simulation modeling. Ecosystem and sociocultural parameters were given importance in addition to critical habitat of a few species versus only fish habitat as generally considered. So last I will talk, this is not the part, but carrying capacity is a must. You cannot decide the uh, future of a project or uh, reject a project unless you do the carrying capacity. So we did the carrying capacity, we did it the uh, upper asymptote, we decided that you know is the six criteria for determination of the K we did, free flowing river length, total river length and the interproject river length. Between the two successive cascading projects, what is the river length should be maintained? Then total river length should be free flowing, no projects at all. Population flux, a lot of people will come. So what should be the population size that the basin can sustain? Forest cover, okay, we know 66% will be covered, but how much actually it is coming? E-flow, CIA index. So these are the parameters based on which we decided the sustainability or the carrying capacity. So these are the carrying capacity methodology calculated. I will not go into details. So free flowing river length we calculated, total river length 148 kilometer. And you can see that free flowing river length we allowed 60 kilometer to flow. Only the remaining ones we propose the dams. And finally, you can see this is the human population influx. What should be the level? Forest plus threshold. So finally, you can see here is the here is the final map where based upon the acceptable projects within the maximum limit of carrying capacity, one, then based on the CI index. So you can see that red line which moves and the two sides the area, so one where we cross, so this Tawang one project in the boundary line, but this Thinguchu and the Sachu the high, so we rejected that. So based upon that, we finally concluded, as you know, these projects to reject or accept is very controversial politically and also the business-wise, very sensitive, so we could give to the country a very, very precisely quantitative assessment with 100% accuracy, a method that can reject or accept a project based upon the carrying capacity of the basin, which will be controversy free. Thank you so much. Thank you, Barik. My colleagues who do this EIA and EC and community impact assessment, they'll be benefited besides many others who, who heard you. Thank you very much. Really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. I can see Atya's uh, raised hand. Dr. Atya, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, please. Good evening, uh, Barik sir. Good evening. Good evening, all of you. Such a wonderful uh, presentation, but uh, you have just actually underlined how complex the whole problem is, you know. That is the takeaway message, that it has just so many multiple dimensions that uh, it let me, let, me interrupt, interrupt you. let me interrupt you your component your component into consideration as well i didn't present you, here although <laughs> you only said equalizer <laughs> <laughs> only the, that is a bad one good ones are also there Please, sir with so many multi dimensional uh, you know uh, problems and to uh, even to assess what the complexity is uh, how do we then target uh, mit this, I, I got uh, your uh, study, but then suppose, you know, if we want to take it forward and you say we want to do a mitigation, you know, for a river, then how do we, from where do we begin then? Because we can't take flow. Uh, I mean, you, you have to take so many parameters, uh, but uh, you know that the baseline has changed and it has changed like permanently. We cannot redo that baseline change. So your diversity and everything would have changed for sure. So how do we then target mitigation? Okay, uh, let me tell you, the best thing is leave the river as such. Is it possible? No. We have to intervene because otherwise we will be 